الرحمن الرحيم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف أنبياء المرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وتابع السنة يوم الدين ما بعد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم الكميد المجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما بارك على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم الكميد المجيد رب إشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني قولي اللهم فعلا بما علمت عالما فعلا وزل علما يا رب العالمين Now we're going to talk about Sulaiman alayhi salam, okay, which is another king which is mentioned in the Quran, okay. His his story is actually one of the main reasons why I started this um, these stories of the Quran, you know, uh, because I just wanted for everyone to be clear, you know, about the um, this the, the episode of Sulaiman alayhi salam in the Quran. I think people often get this mistaken, and I think people don't understand what's happening in the story. And I found that it's really detrimental because the Jews keep this in mind. The Jews. Um, they they put a sh- they put an ayib on Sulaiman alayhi salam. They say like he married the jinn, he did this, this, and this. You know different things they say about him. Okay, and uh, they they call him King Solomon. They don't accept him as a prophet, right? So they have many major issues with Sulaiman alayhi salam. I found that Muslims also have some weird issues with Sulaiman alayhi salam because we don't have accurate information. We hear things from the Jews and the Christians, and we think that's the real stuff. So we should be very careful again. So I I started these stories because of Sulaiman alayhi salam's story. And so we're going to go through his three different stories in the Quran. There is actually four, but I just want to do three because the first one's in Baqarah and it's very short. The first one we're going to do is the army of Sulaiman alayhi salam, which leads into the story of Bilqis, which we'll do tomorrow. And we'll see if we can finish Bilqis in a day. If not, we might need two days. Depends. Okay. And then after that, we'll talk about Sulaiman alayhi salam and the um, the horses that he received, which is a sort of sad. Okay. Which is a it's a it's a really powerful story. All these stories are powerful. These stories are amazing. I love these stories so much. Like I listen to, I do it every single like year, just so I can remind myself about how great uh, how great Sulaiman Islam was and how much of inspiration he is to us as Muslims. Okay, so let's let's get into it, inshallah. Let's really just break it down. So when we're talking about Surah Al Naml, okay, and I hope inshallah one day we can sit down and just really go through the Quran from beginning to end. If we're talking about Surah Naml, okay, Surah Naml is one of the most unique most unique story is surahs in all the Quran. And I mean it. You know, we're saying Quran is you know amazing, amazing, amazing. Surah Naml is amazing amongst amazingness. Like it is exquisite. It is extraordinary. Okay. And Surah Naml has a very interesting theme. Okay. That things in this life are not what they seem. You're seeing things in front of you. You can't just take whatever you see for face value. You have to think beyond it. Okay. You have to think beyond it. So this surah really asks us to do one thing is number one is to look around. And number two is after looking around is to actually understand something from the things that we look around from. Okay. So these two things are really important. So this surah, if you don't believe me, has, has so many different things in it. It has miracles. It has jinns. It has animals talking. It is a very, it's a very amazing surah. It's an amazing surah. Okay. And if uh, the, one of the first stories within it, which is one story that we're not going to be able to cover this, this Ramadan, I hope one day, inshallah, we can, was when Musa a.s. was shown the fire. And the fire, quote unquote, spoke, right? Now, if Musa Islam stopped at the fire, you think the fire was speaking to him, but clearly the, fi- the fire was a, a medium, uh, the jelly, a manifestation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's power. Allah that was speaking through the fire. So things that he saw in front of him weren't exactly what they, were, they weren't supposed to be taking for face value, right? That's the first thing that we learned in Surah Al-Naman, okay? So Allah Ta'ala starts off the surah with explaining about those who have belief about the judgment day will live a completely different life because they see things differently. So if you believe in Qiyamah, your life should be different. You should not be living like everyone else. You have a different protocol. You have a different um, you know, grade of life. You're living in a different quality. Just because of what? Because we believe in Qiyamah. Okay? Because we're certain about the last day, we don't get distracted. We don't dist- get distracted from things that we see. A lot of things that are happening today, unfortunately, is that Muslims and non-Muslims, everyone is getting distracted by the day-to-day life because they're worried about death and they're worried about the virus and things like that. And Muslims have already accepted mawt as a reality. We hear like every khutbah, right? We see janazas all the time. We're just so used to these things. We shouldn't be so scared or worried or frightened because qiyamah is much, it's a much bigger worry, really, honestly speaking. A person who dies in this virus, and may Allah save us all, we remind my, I remind myself and remind everyone here because we lost a lot of shiuch in this, in this month, right? They are martyrs, inshallah, you know, they died as a martyr. And a martyr is relaxed on the day of judgment. They wait for the day of judgment to be done, you know. A martyr waits for Qiyamah to be done. They're just sitting there waiting for Qiyamah to be done to enter into the place in Jannah. That's all that's going to happen for them. They have no hisab. If they have no debt, they have nothing to worry about in terms of questioning. So remember these things, inshallah. They keep us in control and they keep us in perspective and we don't get distracted by what's happening around us, okay. And others, Allah Ta'ala says, that they adorn their actions and they wander on aimlessly. So there are people in this life who will understand what life is about and they'll focus, they'll be focused towards the goal. And there are others who are completely blind. Okay. 
There are others who are completely blind who don't see the way, right? And so, and you'll notice animals in the surah that they will be so focused. These animals will have concern for themselves and the worship of Allah, which we'll get into inshallah. It's amazing stories. I'm telling you, every single one of these stories is amazing. Really. So, Muhammad is an exquisite prophet. He's an amazing prophet. He just has so many things for us to learn from, mashallah. Okay. So, we're going to glimpse into their lives as well. So, this surah, mashallah, is, again, in summary, shows us that if you have seen it, you should accept it. Okay. The uh, story in the beginning that's brought is Fir'aun and Musa, alayhi salam. Fir'aun, his story was someone who, who knew, but he rejected it, okay? And of course, it's followed up with the story of those who know and who will accept it. So it's a story of, of people who, did, who knew but didn't accept. Now a story of those who know and accept. And this story is, of course, the story of Sayyidina Dawood and Sulaiman alayhi salam, okay? So without further ado, that's my quick introduction. So that way, the next couple of days, it's all set and we're all ready to go, okay? So again, the idea of seeing and not trusting what your eyes are showing you, okay? Keep that in mind. It's going to come up multiple times throughout the, the stories that we go through, right? So, surely we gave, وَلَقَدْ آتَيْنَا دَاوُدَ وَسُلَيْمَانَ عِلْمًا Surah Al-Naman, okay, in the 19th Jews. He says that, we, surely we gave knowledge to Dawood and Sulaiman. Okay, we gave knowledge to Dawood and Sulaiman. So they said, Alhamdulillahi الَّذِي فَضَّلَنَا لَا كَثِيرٍ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ They said, all praise be, belongs to Allah, who made us excel, many of his believing servants. Okay. We gave them special knowledge, Allah SWT says. We gave them ilma, okay? And because of that knowledge, they went to go express their gratitude. Okay, a lot of times what we think is, is benefit in this life is that we have money or we have a status. We have some type of authority in this world. But Allah SWT doesn't show that through the prophets. The prophets are only, look, Dawood and Sulaiman Muslim have kingdoms, okay? They have castles, they have palaces, they have horses, they have mansions, they have so many things. They have so many things of dunyawi, worldly benefits. But they're not praising Allah because of any of those things. They're praising Allah Ta'ala because of what? Because they received knowledge from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. What we forget is that knowledge is the greatest of all treasures. Okay? Now they give us tawfiq to understand that. So they make shukr to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and they, they're saying it openly. They're speaking about it. Another thing that happens when it comes to gratitude, we never talk about those things. We never tell people. We never speak about those things that we're grateful for. You know, a good way to get someone out of depression is that they just need to talk about their, 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 um, their blessings that they received in life. So Sulaiman and Dawood are both expressing their gratitude. They're showing Allah, Allah, we're happy. We're so happy that you gave us these things. Okay? And so Allah Ta'ala tells us in the Quran, He says in Surah Al Duha, at the end of Surah Al Duha, that as for the blessings of your Lord, you speak about them, you talk about them. You should talk about these blessings. They're not out of, if a person is talking about the blessings of Allah Ta'ala, that's not being arrogant. That's only being grateful. Okay? It can be boastful. If you're doing it in the wrong context, if you're just like, if someone's like, uh, you know, um, if, if someone is, for example, like they, ha they had an accident, you're like, well, alhamdulillah, I have legs. <laughs> like, don't do that, right? That's just, that's just being mean, right? Don't do that, you know? So, of course, there's a time and place for, for speaking about the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But it's definitely from Islam. It's mandub. It's recommended that people will come together and just talk about the blessings of Allah. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, one time he came and he saw the Sahaba Radhiyam just sitting together and all they were doing was talking about the, the, the blessing of Islam that they received. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, he mentions them amongst angels with them. He's like, these are my servants that are talking about the blessings I gave them and I'm talking about them with my angels, you know. SubhanAllah, there's a lot of blessing in terms of talking about Allah Ta'ala's blessings, right? So Allah Ta'ala is showing us how to be thankful, uh, to thank Him for His blessings, right? So, and Sulaiman salam, so we continue. Well, what is the Sulaiman with Dawood? Sulaiman salam inherited from Dawood alayhi salam, okay? And said, Ya yuhan nas, ulimna mantiqat tayr, utina min kulli shayin, okay? And you can see the way Sulaiman is speaking, okay? Again, look at this position he's in. Inheriting from Dawood alayhi salam, the scholars have interpreted in many different ways. One of the most prominent ways is what? He, he first inherited his kingdom. Dawood alayhi kingdom goes to Sulaiman alayhi salam. And he also inherited his nubuwa, his prophethood. Okay? And Sulaiman alayhi also inherited the knowledge of Dawood alayhi salam. He, he, has, he has basically become the second Dawood on the earth. You can call him Dawood al Thani, for example. Right? He's the second Dawood alayhi salam. Right? So he is in a very, very amazing position. In terms of the world, he's conquered the majority of the, the known world at the time. Okay? And at this time, you can see the way he's speaking to people. Ya nas, He says, oh people, we have been taught the speech of birds. We've been given education of their speech. min kulli shay. And we've been given from all things. Okay. You can see he's saying, we have been taught. We have been given. Okay. He doesn't say, I know. He doesn't say, I have. He says, we have been taught and we have been given. 
because he's reminding everyone that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who gave it to him. Okay? And subhanAllah, this is a man again on top of the entire world, right? The known world at the time. Just reminding everyone that he's still saying that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given me everything. You saw the same thing in Dhul Qarnayn we talked about a couple of days ago. Same thing happens with Sulaiman alayhi and Dawud alayhi salam, right? And he goes, in the lahu al fadl mubin. This is indeed the clear grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? So now Allah ta'ala, what he does is he shows us, he shows us very beautifully, the an example of Sulaiman alayhi salam's power. Okay? You heard at the last ayah, Allah ta'ala said, we have, we, um, Sulaiman alayhi salam said, I'm sorry, he said that we have been given from all things. Okay? So in terms of a king, the one of the greatest of all things that a king can have is a strong military, a strong army, okay? A strong army. So what does Sulaiman salam do? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates a mahshar. He creates a, um, a gathering. You know, like they have military parades. So Sulaiman uh, military parade is starting. So then his army is brought together. It's brought for Sulaiman salam. This assembly is happening. This huge jalsa. Or you can say this huge march is going to happen for Sulaiman alayhi salam. Min al-jinni wal-insi wal-tayr. From jinns, from ins, from human beings. Wal-tayr. So all of his forces are coming together. The jinns are coming, the humans are coming, and the birds are coming. Okay? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't just say, okay, so then you have on the, in the front of the army, you have the jinns. In the middle of the army, you have the, the human beings, which are the, the, the core of the army. Right? And then on top of them, you have the birds. So Allah Ta'ala mentioned the most ajeeb one first, which is the jinnat. You're like, wow, he has jinns. And then Allah Ta'ala finishes with one of the most ajeeb things too, is what? That you can say that there are kings in the world, whatever. They're not going to have jinns in the army. Maybe some of them have like jinns in their possession or whatever. But no one has control of the birds. No one has control of the birds. So Allah Ta'ala starts with something exclusive to Sulaiman. And Allah Ta'ala ends with something exclusive to Sulaiman. He says the first thing that he's made exclusive with is the control of the jinnat. And the last thing is what? That the birds on top of him hovering. Okay? Now Allah Dada talks about them. And then finally Allah Dada says, Bahum yuza'un. Thousands upon thousands of soldiers, humans, jinns, and birds. I don't know if he had penguins or whatever he had, but he had lots of birds, right? They're all flying, right? Now the thing is that birds are, are, are if you're looking at their, their flight patterns, although some of them fly in, in um, in, in um, the same form and this in the same fashion right in, like in a v shape whatever right the same formations right many times you're going to see birds all scattered all over the place right you know human beings are kind of lazy right if we're standing with with people in salah we see us like moving left and right right same thing with jinns right you definitely think that jinns would not be under control of anyone so allah Dada mentions at the end of the ayah for whom yuza'un the word yuza'un means to be completely under control meaning everyone's in formation so you know like you saw birds flying like a v Right? So the birds that are flying in Sulaiman Islam's army are all flying in that V shape or whatever shape that they were put into. Okay? The human beings are completely all standing up straight, upright, and not moving an inch. You know, like again in Sufuf, right? When you're standing in prayer, you notice that people who are standing in prayer, sometimes the guy is like a little lazy, so he's like a little hanging back. The other one's a little ahead, right? And you can't, everyone's, it doesn't look organized. Even our prayers sometimes don't look organized, right? And if you're going to say, Sheikh, but Sheikh, mashallah, you know, Muslims, alhamdulillah, you know, mashallah, our lines are so, so nice, mashallah. All right, let's just go check out our shoe rack and then we'll see how orderly we are, okay? Oh, no, Sheikh, you know, but, uh, no, but then let's check out our cars. You know, we don't even know how to park properly. Right? Like, look, we're very disorganized. We're very disorganized. What Allah is saying about Sulaiman's army is that everyone was disciplined. Absolutely disciplined. The birds were in line, the jinnat were in line, and the human beings were in line. Everyone was in line. No one's moving one single step forward. That's how well organized they were. Such a powerful, ma massive looking army. Everyone's moving together in sequence. The parade is going. This military parade is marching and completely going through everywhere. Wherever they need to go, people are watching in awe and power of this is Sulaiman, the, the Nabi of Allah. The messenger of Allah on this earth, Allah that has sent him to this world to, to guide us and to protect us. So everyone's watching this army. And so everything is done again by Allah Ta'ala for Sulaiman And so before we skip up to the next part, which is the most important part, right? I just want everyone to recognize, subhanAllah, if you're like, wow, what an amazing army Sulaiman had. And, you know, uh, like he, everything's under control for him. I mean, subhanAllah, you know, I, we never appreciate our blessings. Again, the, the first part of the story is about appreciating your blessings. Appreciate the blessing that you have control over your bladder, for example. You know, the fact that you, you can choose when to use the bathroom. You know, subhanAllah, you have an ability to blink when you want to blink. You have an ability to speak when you want to speak. You have hands you have control over. We have a lot of control. And we forget about these things because we look at other people's blessings and then we just completely lose the blessings that Allah gave us. Never lose sight of these things. That makes us ungrateful. 
we look at other people and say the car that they have, the house that they have, the the wife that they have, astaghfirullah. Like we look at terrible things, of other, you know, other things of people, and then we feel terrible about ourselves. We feel miserable and things like that. Don't be like that. Tell yourself what Allah that has given us control over. There are many things Allah has given us control over. I tell you, man, the person in the hospital right now that has no control over their breathing, their, 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 air, their air in their lungs, the oxygen that's coming into their, their, into their lungs, they have no control over it. But you and I, subhanAllah, we can breathe properly. We don't need a ventilator. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Thumma alhamdulillah. Thank, you know, how many of us have everything under control? You know, subhanAllah, some of us have, alhamdulillah, our kids are in school. Alhamdulillah, we have a really great uh, household. You know, Alhamdulillah, the kids are memorizing Quran or they memorize Quran or they're be becoming ulama or they're becoming scholars, whatever it might be. Alhamdulillah, we have a lot of blessings, a lot of favors from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we should be thankful to Allah Azza wa Jal. Who keeps all of these things in control for us? It's Allah. Allah is the one who keeps in control everything for us. And we never thank him for any of these things. So the Sunnah Islam is going with this huge army. Okay, He's walking through and then they reach through the valley of the ants. Allah calls it the valley of the ants. He doesn't call it like, you know, you're wondering like where it is, okay? We're, we're falling into the questions that are relevant. Where, who, what, when, why. We, these types of questions, don't, don't ask these questions. Ask the question, Allah Ta'ala define the place by the people that live there, okay? The place is not called Pakistan. The place is not called Bangladesh. The place is not called India. It's not called America. Uh, you know, it should be called obese people land. It should be called like Muslims who are lazy land. You know, like it's defined by the people who live there. Allah Subhanahu Ta'ala is defining it in a different way. We thought that the place should be called the name that the people gave it. Allah SWT doesn't call it by the, the name that the people gave it. Allah that calls it by the name of the people that live there. Okay? The way you are will define the land. The way that you and I are will define the land. So Allah SWT calls it the valley of the ants. Although there are probably other creatures that live there. Tons of other creatures. But the most important creatures in that place are the ants. Okay? Because of what they do and how important they are to Allah SWT. Keep this in mind. So when you reach the valley of the ants, thousands upon thousands of soldiers walking through, marching through. There is a small hill there, okay? That's why I'm saying about calling it the Valley of the Ants is a big exaggeration. It's a big exaggeration to call it the Valley of the Ants because you know ants are not going to take up the entire valley. They're probably taking up a very small area, right? So now they reach that place where the ants are, that hill, the ant hill that's there, okay? And so now there's a, there is a worker ant, okay? And I want to just take a little side point about um, unnecessary questions again. Call it Namla, right? The Namla said, the the... The gender that's used is the feminine gender, right? It's Anath, right? Qalat namlatun, right? So then subhanAllah, the shuyukh have said, Allah Akbar, this is Dalil, that if you look at all the worker ants, all of them are females. SubhanAllah. Allah Akbar, mashallah. You know, alhamdulillah. <laughs> okay, why, mashallah. Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to knock it, but it's kind of, I don't think that's the point here, okay? Allah knows best. Okay, Qalat namla, so a, a worker ant was, was you know, because ants, um, um, some of them have wings, right? And so some of the scholars have actually said that the reason why Sulaiman Yusuf could understand them was because he could understand the speech of birds. Okay. I mean, Allah Ta'ala knows best about that, but it's kind of interesting, maybe. Okay. So, in any case, the, the ant was, was buzzing, or was flying around, and it was sending a warning message to all the other ants. It said, Ya Ayyuhan Namal. It said, Oh ants, Udukhulu, enter Masakinakum, enter your homes, okay, enter your dwelling places. Suleiman and Wajunudu and his army will crush you وَهُمْ لَا يَشْعُرُونَ and they'll do it without knowing. So to don't let Suleiman and his army crush you all while they do it without realizing. Okay. So now subhanAllah when we're talking about the speech of animals before I, I just quick digression about animals who are well aware of what's happening around them. People think that animals are just dumb animals or just dumb things. You know they even say dumb animals. Astaghfirullah no animal is dumb. Okay. Uh, Sunnah so is praising Allah. He's thanking Allah because Allah gave him the ability to understand the speech of birds. Okay, meaning that the speech of birds is extremely complex. It's really, it's a really sophisticated language. You know, Subhanallah, human beings can understand so many languages. We can't understand animals for anything. <laughs> you know, it's a, it's a, it's ajib. And if you don't believe me, look at this, 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 um, this ant here in the speech that it's giving here. It's a very sophisticated speech. What does it say? Ya yu namal. He uses nida. I'm going to mention the Arabic terms first. Ya yu namal. He uses nida. Udukhulu. He uses amr. It says masakinakum. He uses a zarf. Then it says it uses indar. La yahtimannakum suriman wa junudu wa hum la yashurun. And it gives a uzar at the end. It gives i'tizar at the end. So in one message, the ant, the ant does what? It gives a call. It calls everyone. And it says udukhulu. It commands everyone. 
It says, where do you all need to go? Go into your homes. It gives a direction for everyone. And it says, says, be careful, Suleiman and his army will stomp on you, will squish you. It gives a warning. And then the last moment, what does the end do? It makes an excuse for Suleiman and his army too. It's amazing. It's amazing. So I mentioned this because I want everyone to remember the next time you kill a cockroach, just kind of like, you know, at least read like a oh, Bismillah Akbar or something. You know, like, just remember what you're doing to it. You know, it's part of a, if part of a society. It has a family. Probably has wife and kids like you and I do. You know, I don't think it wants to be squished like that. You know, like, remember these things. You know, the, these, are, these are things that Muslims should be aware of. We don't have any love for animals anymore. Muslims completely hate animals. It's like, it's like a fact. You Muslims just completely hate animals. We don't care about them anymore. We don't have any consideration for them. Remember these things, okay? Allah is showing us in the Quran about how sophisticated the speech of an animal was, okay? If this is how great its tongue is, it has a heart, right? It has a mind. It has all these different things that you and I just don't understand. And so is it right for us to oppress them and abuse them like that? You know, subhanAllah, again, coronavirus is taking away the virus of the earth, which is human beings. We are getting taken away from the earth. And alhamdulillah, the animals are able to come out again and live like they wanted to live before, okay? So just keep those things in mind, right? So the ant did a job of a prophet. The ant did a job of a prophet. It warned its people. This is why Allah calls it the valley of the ants. Because the most important people to, in all of existence are the Anbiya And this ant is not a prophet, but is a da'iya. It is someone who calls people, invites people to find success and save themselves from destruction. Okay? So when you and I are doing the work of da'wah, when you and I were doing the work of da'wah, we're calling people to save them from Jahannam, to save them from the punishment of the grave. You are doing a work which Allah that praised an ant for in the Quran. Okay? Allah is praising us as well for doing this type of work. This is a work that's so valuable. If the ant is just saving them from, the, from a worldly punishment, you and I are saving them from the hereafter punishment. You have such a great mission for anyone who is involved or dedicated or working on their family or working on their friends and working on everyone around them to give them da'wah of Islam. You're doing an amazing work. And Allah acknowledges that he takes the words of an ant and shows you how important Allah recorded the words of an ant that's giving da'wah to its people. Okay? And if you're saying, well, subhanAllah, the ant told everyone to self-quarantine, mashallah, that's also a point that we can get here too. May Allah give us all tawfiq, mashallah. Okay? So now, subhanAllah, we'll, we'll transition. So, of course, Sulaiman so is listening to the ant and he can hear them. He can hear the ant. Okay? So already he's heard the amazing speech of the ant. And that's already, like, you and I are translating it. Imagine actually being there and hearing the ant. Okay? Now, in order to hear the frequency or the 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 small voice of an ant, right? You need to have really good ears, okay? You, you know, SubhanAllah, Sulaiman is acknowledging the fact that I'm hearing an ant right now. You know? I, just, I can't even imagine the feeling of that. I can't even imagine the feeling of that. He's hearing an ant speak, okay? He's knowing what the ant is saying. He's understanding the ant. He's comprehending it. No one else is comprehending it. The, the jinn are not comprehending. The insan are not comprehending. No one is comprehending it, right? Sulaiman so is coming up to the ant hill and he's telling everyone, stop. And everyone's wondering why we're stopping. And it's sometimes looking down, he says that there's an ant hill here. We cannot squish the ants. Okay? So the feeling of knowing and understanding, it is one of the best feelings. You know, people wonder why, you know, I would, you know, why would anyone spend this, this much time researching the Quran or studying Islam or giving your life, you know, like SubhanAllah, and I, and I encourage every kid who's, who's making this plan to become a scholar or become a hafiz, you know. In terms of dunya, there are many other outlets of dunya. There are many other outlets of dunya. You can get so much money from so many different places. You know, there's so many different jobs out there. And I'm not saying as a scholar to or alim of deen, whatever, to not get a job, whatever. But many times, because you're dedicated to this work, 100% of your day is dedicated to this work. You know, like in order to prepare this lesson, for example, four or five hours of research is required, right? And then preparing the presentation, whatever. It takes a lot of effort. Okay, it takes a lot of effort. You're not gonna have time like other people have time. The quality that you want to produce for people, the amount of heart you want to give to it, right? You need to give your entire life for this work, right? So the thing is that, you know, people would wonder, like, why, why don't you just go and enjoy, you know? Why don't you just go into the restaurants? Why don't you just go and enjoy the world and stuff like that, you know? Imam Muhammad, rahimullah ta'ala, the student of Imam Hanifa, he said something so beautiful. You know, he said when, when they understood rulings, right, of the of deen and stuff, he would say that, you know, we have such a feeling in our chest right now that if all the kings and all the rulers of the world were to fight us to get it, you know, to extract this, uh, from if the kings, I'm sorry, he said, if the kings and this the rulers of the world knew what was in our chest, they would they would fight us with their soldiers and their armies to get this feeling. You know, Imam Shafi would would ex explain the feeling of understanding something in Deen. You know, Ibn Abbas would say like you know like the reason why I love doing these programs is just because I like sharing what I learned from the Quran with everyone. 
Ibn Abbas said, when I understand something from the Quran, when I understand something from the Quran, I just want to scream it out and share it with the world. And that's how we feel. Like I just, you know, this feeling of the heart of learning and understanding, it just feels so great. Now, if this is the feeling of you and I, subhanAllah, just reading some books, imagine the feeling that Allah Ta'ala is giving you direct knowledge of what ants are speaking about, what the world is speaking about around you. That's what Sulaiman is experiencing right now. Then, then, then the ant goes and talks about Sulaiman Islam. The ant actually says Sulaiman Islam's name. Where did it learn Sulaiman Islam's name from? Okay. The, the ant, he's become so famous. You know, people are so famous because of like Twitter followers and Facebook, whatever. SubhanAllah, Sunnah is famous amongst the ants. Uh, try to find some sheikh that's famous amongst ants. The ants are like, oh, bro, did you see that sheikh? Sheikh Abdullah Mahmoud, whatever, you know? Like, no one's going to, no ants are going to be talking about them. Birds talk about, no one's going to, you know, animals aren't going to talk about them. But ants are talking about Sunnah is They know about him, right? That's why he mentioned by the name, right? And it's a sign, if you, if the, if the world is talking about you, it's a sign that Allah has accepted you. The hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu which the Prophet ﷺ said that if Allah loves a slave, he tells Jibreel ﷺ, oh, so, oh Jibreel, I love my so-and-so slave. You love him too. Jibreel ﷺ hears the message and he goes to all the angels and says, oh angels, Allah loves this person, so you love him too. That the angels go to the world and say, all of the world, oh the world, uh, so-and-so is a beloved of Allah. You all love him, so the entire world loves him. The ants make dua in their holes for the student of knowledge, right? They make God for his forgiveness or her forgiveness. So this is a sign of that. So Muhammad is a person who Allah has accepted so much. The ants, the ants are even praising him, okay? And then the final thing that happens is what? That he found that his name is honored by these angels. It's not just, just mentioning because he's a, he's a terrible guy, like he's a Fir'aun on the earth, astaghfirullah. They're actually praising him. How does he know that? Because at the end of the speech of the ants, the ant goes and says, وَهُمْ لَا يَشْعُرُونَ Says that the only reason why Suleiman and his army would crush you because Sulaiman and his army just don't know that you're there. If they knew that, he, if they knew that you were there, of course they would never squish you, right? And Sulaiman heard them call the ant, and so he stops the entire army and says, "No army, you cannot squish them. We know they're there, <laughs> right?" So it said they would not realize, and so of course, if he realized, he would never do it. Okay. So at this moment of having all these things combined, the reason why I'm going through this entire sp- uh, section about Sulaiman's understanding is because at this moment you can understand how happy he felt. An overwhelming happiness, unbelievable happiness of learning and understanding and knowing and seeing that ants are even praising him in their holes and respecting him too and honoring him as well. The, you know, there's so much that's going in the heart of Sulaiman. There's so much happiness here, okay? And the worry about happiness is this. When people become super, super happy in this world, they have a problem or a, a tendency, they have an issue of maybe going committing sins, okay? Maybe becoming arrogant, like Iblis, okay? Because he felt that, wow, look how much ibadah I'm doing. Look how much worship I'm doing. I deserve so much more. And so then he ended up going towards the path of arrogance. There's a big worry here. The worry about happiness is, where does it lead? Okay? The right way that happiness should lead to in life, when you and I as Muslims, remember this lesson, that you and I as Muslims, when we become happy, it should make us humble. It should make us humble. We should become so humbled by Allah. That, Alhamdulillah, I have kids. Alhamdulillah, I have a family. Alhamdulillah, I have a car. Alhamdulillah, I have a house. Alhamdulillah, I have lungs. Alhamdulillah, I have eyes. I have control of everything. Alhamdulillah, I'm just happy. Mashallah. I'm just happy. Really, I'm just happy for Ramadan. I'm, you know, even if I'm doing terrible, Alhamdulillah, I'm happy. Allah gave me an opportunity for Ramadan. Just be humble. It should lead to humility. Okay? And gratitude, being, making shukr to Allah, is humility by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? And be grateful to that Lord who bestowed all of it because He's kind. Because He's just so kind to us. We didn't deserve any of these things. You know, if we came to America, we only came here because Allah gave us a tawfiq. If we have kids, it's because Allah gave us tawfiq to have children. If we have eyes and ears and hearts, it's because Allah gave us these things. There's nothing that we earned because we deserved it. We only received because Allah gave. Sulaiman is teaching us these things. So what happened was what? For Sulaiman is He smiled out of happiness from what it said. Okay? And now at this moment, being on top of the world, having everything in your power, everything you can control, you know, and this is a reminder for myself and everyone here that you can be happy. It's jayas. I give you a fatwa. I give you a supreme fatwa. Grand Mufti fatwa here. That everyone here can be happy, mashallah. It's fine to be happy. It's, it's, it's Mahmood. It's Mandub. It's, it's, it's part of Islam to be happy. <laughs> you know, Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allah reveals the Quran to him and says, Ma anzalna alaykal Qur'ana li tashqa. We did not reveal the Quran on you so you become depressed. We reveal the Quran on you so you become happy. <laughs> You know, we want you all to be happy. Allah Ta'ala wants you to be happy. Allah Ta'ala wants you to be excited. Allah Ta'ala wants you to feel good. Because if you're happy, it means what? You'll be grateful to Allah. 
So just, you know, don't, don't feel against it. Okay, wow, you went to Disneyland and you, you enjoyed the rides. Astaghfirullah, I should make even a thousand istighfar because I smiled three times. Astaghfirullah, I, I laughed at that person's joke. La hawla la quwwata. A'udhu billahi min ash No, that's not, that's not Islam. That might be some other religion. That's not Islam. Islam is that it's fine to be happy. It's fine to thank Allah to, you know, for the things he's given us. Because happiness, if you're doing it the right way, it's just going to lead to gratitude. Like it led to Sunnah and being grateful. So he starts to make a dua. He says, after he hears the speech of an ant, and becomes so humbled by what the ant has said, becomes so grateful to Allah, he starts smiling. Then he goes and makes this dua, and I want everyone to learn this dua. Please, inshallah, take some time to memorize this dua. It is, it is in Surah An-Naml. I'll get the ayah of the, of the, the Quran in a second, inshallah. But the ayah, it starts with, Rabbi awzi'ni. It says, Oh Allah, enable me to become grateful to, you, to your favor that you have bestowed on me. Okay? He uses the word awzi'ni. If you remember, we talked about yuza a little while ago. Waza meant that the army was in order and control. He's asking Allah, Allah, keep me in control. Allah, keep me in line. He says, Allah, keep me in waza. I don't want to lose control. I don't want to lose focus. I don't want to make a mistake. That I never forget to be grateful to you. And I, that I never step out of line. Because one thing that a person who is who's becoming grateful to Allah, one thing they're worried about is, wow, if I become too happy, maybe I'll make a mistake. Maybe I'll become disrespectful to Allah. Maybe I'll say something wrong. You know, it happens, right? Sometimes our tongues kind of slip. Ya Allah, I don't want my tongue to slip. Allah, I don't want my heart to slip. I don't want my eyes to slip. I don't want my hands to slip. I don't want to make a mistake, Ya Allah. I'm, I'm really grateful for the blessings you gave. Don't make me into a sin. I don't want to commit a sin with these blessings. So he's saying, Rabbi Awzi'ni, Allah, please keep me control. That I can be grateful to the blessings that you gave me. I don't never ever want to step out of line. I want to be a soldier in his place. Like my army was in order, Ya Allah. I want you to keep me in line as well. Okay? And he says, Wa'ala wali day. And he also says, and on my uh, on my parents as well. He says, and on my, my parents. He doesn't he doesn't just you know a person who's grateful to Allah will not forget their parents because their parents is, are the source of their blessings. So a lot of times what happens is we forget that our parents actually came here to America and they gave us this opportunity. We didn't start from the bottom now I'm here type of thing, right? We we we, we got the stuff because of the, the blessing of the people before us, the generations before us. So Sunnah so said, Ya Allah, I don't forget my parents. Allah allow me to be grateful for the blessings you gave me. And the blessings you gave my parents too. I, you gave them a lot as well. And he says, Ya Allah, and I just want, other than being in control, Ya Allah, another thing I want is that I just want a good deed. Just a good deed. One good deed, he says. Salihan. I want one good deed. Tardahu. Ya Allah, that you are pleased with. I just want one amazing dua. Just one good deed, Ya Rab. Ibn Mas'ud said, If I knew one of my sajdas was accepted by Allah, that's enough for my life. That's enough for your life. Really, it's enough for your life. He says, Ya Allah, I just want one good deed that you're pleased with. Just that one light of the Qadr night, one sadaqah, one thawab, one hasana, something, Ya Allah. Whatever it might be, I smiled at someone, I made a joke and people laughed and then, then I got reward. I just want one good deed, Ya Allah, that you're just happy with. You know? uh, because it, it's not enough that a good deed looks good on the outside. If it's good on the outside but Allah doesn't accept it, then it's worthless. It's absolutely worthless. It needs to be accepted by Allah. So always make dua that every single good deed we do is accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I am just being so humble though. He says, Ya Allah, just one. He has so many good deeds already, but he says, Ya Allah, I just want one. Just one. I don't know if any of them are accepted. But if you could just accept one, Ya Rab, that's all be enough. It'll be enough for me. Okay? And then he says, The last thing that he says, he says, oh Allah, enter me through your mercy amongst your righteous slaves. He says, through your mercy, Ya Rab, you know, you can enter Jannah and I want everyone to remember this. You can enter Jannah through easy, e uh, an easy path or a hard path. You can go through a lot of difficulty and get into a really high place in Jannah for those who can. You can go through a lot of struggle, a lot of trials. You can go through a lot of viruses and diseases and sickness in this world. And you get into Jannah for those, okay? You have that path. And some brothers and sisters really want to go through that. That's up to you. That's completely fine, bro. Do you, whatever. What does Sulaiman Aysam ask for? He says, Ya Allah, I want to go through your mercy, okay? I don't want to go through a hard path. I want general fit those, but, but easy, like, you know, luxury class going to general fit those. I don't want to go through, like, economy, whatever. I want, I want to be in first class seats going to Jannah, okay? So he's saying, Ya Allah, I, I want to go through shukr. I don't want to go through sabr. If some people want to go through sabr, that's up to you. I'd rather go through shukr. It's easier to go through thanking Allah Ta'ala, and Allah Ta'ala can still give you the same stuff, okay? It's the path the Nabi Sarai that, that is what? That you go through the easy way and not the difficult way, okay? So Sumayi Sam asked for that. And he says, I do not deserve Jannah through my actions. He wants Jannah through Allah's mercy. Okay? And so it's such a beautiful dua. I encourage everyone in Shalata to just memorize this dua. 
to learn this dua. We'll leave it there. This is the first part, inshallah. We'll do the part two about the hudhud, which is a very interesting part, mashallah. This is a dua for those people who fear doing something against gratitude. If you're worried about your, your connection with Allah, and you're worried, Ya Allah, I don't know if I'm doing right or wrong, make this dua. This dua will keep you in control. It will keep you in check. So that way you don't make mistakes. And Allah Ta'ala perhaps will bless you with that one night that you wanted. That one night that Allah Ta'ala will accept. And that one night Allah Ta'ala will change the direction of our life. And that one night that Allah Ta'ala will give us jandal for those because of it, inshallah ta'ala. We ask Allah Ta'ala for so much tawfiq and hidayah. And he allows us to memorize this dua. Again, let me just quickly get you the, 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 the number of the, um, the, number of the um, ayah. So very quickly, sorry about that. It's ayah number 19 of Surah An-Namr. Ayah number 19 of Surah An-Namr. You know, they give us all the fear to memorize it, inshallah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.